everybody. Welcome to Hursery 2.0. Um, we were just listening there to a sonata number nine by Hélène de Mongeroux. So my name is Kendra Harder. My pronouns are she, hers, and this class is being hosted by the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra. So a huge thank you to the SSO and Executive Director Mark Turner. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land where we are gathered and live streaming from is Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree, Dakota, Nakota, Dene, Soto, and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the Indigenous ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We encourage you also to take a moment to consider the Indigenous land on which you reside and offer a sense of gratitude to the Indigenous peoples who stewarded this land and water long before us. So if you will notice in the bottom of your Zoom window, we have the chat and we have the Q&A. Please feel free to say hello in the chat. Tell us where you're from. Um, we'd love to know where everyone's listening from. And then if you have any questions throughout the class um, or at the end of the class, please put them in the Q&A function there. And I'll do my best to leave some time at the end to answer any questions. And as always, helping me on the tech side of things is Matthew Praxis. So everybody, please give a big hand to Matt. And without further ado, let's start the slideshow. There we go. So in today's, um, today's concept for the class, I want to look at composers who rarely get any attention simply because we don't know very much about them. Um, and this is because there is very little surviving documentation about them. So I feel like sometimes as a result, what happens is these people just get forgotten about only because we like to understand where people are coming from historically. We like to know the stories, the, their life, what happened around it. And so, yeah, sometimes I just feel that these names just get lost. Um, so things that, you know, this is all about documentation with history. And this is something that affects all genders, not just women. Um, because, yeah, like things just get lost or maybe they weren't even made in the first hand. Um, for example, one of the composers I had considered for this week, Sofia de la Porta, the only thing that I could find out about her was what was written in this book. I couldn't find anything online. Um, and they don't even have her dates. Um, they just have that she was from Greece and from the second half of the 19th century. They don't know when she was born. They don't know when she died. Um, and so we know about her because of her eight compositions that bear the name of Heroes of 1821 one Greek War of Independence. Like in this book, there's more information about the score than there is about Sophia. Um, so sometimes all we know is even just their presence because of the score. So take, for example, this opera here by Charlotte Jack. That's the only reason that we know that this woman existed is because of this score. And so all of these women were composers that wrote great music. Um, but because we don't know anything about them, I just fear that they risk being lost to history is merely a footnote. So today we're actually mostly going to be listening to music. Um, the information I do share is what I could find about them. There very well could be more information about them elsewhere, maybe in some archives and libraries I don't have access to. Um, but yeah, so another example of a composer with only a score to inform us of her existence is Lise Ginglas. Um, how I came upon Lise was I was actually working on finding composers for next week's class about the guitar. And so I was scouring through all of my RCM guitar books um, just to see how, you know, how many women were in the syllabus. Um, spoiler, spoiler alert, in the 2011 edition, there's only one composer, and that is this Lise Gingras. Um, so we'll see right there. This is literally all the information that I have about Lise, was that she was born in 1949. Um, I could guess that she is French-Canadian. Maybe she's still alive. Um, at the bottom of the score, 
um, it, there's a reference to Claude Guignol, who, who um, provided this piece of music. Um, so I actually tried to get a hold of Claude to get some more information. And I like, I literally spent probably 40, 45 minutes just trying to compose a small email in French. But my French is really bad. So like it, it took me 40 to 45 minutes. And then I hit send and the email bounced right back because it didn't exist anymore. <laughs> so all we know about Lise is she was born in 1949 and she wrote a piece of beginner guitar music. So I'm going to have Matt set up the piece of music here. This is the Volstotum. I remember playing this on the guitar. Um, oh, and it's me playing guitar. Uh, us only maybe having a score to inform us about the women, sometimes we actually don't have any remaining music at all. Um, and we, we know about them from documents such as maybe where they lived or something like that. Um, take, for example, Angiola Teresa Moratori Scanabecchi. That's a, that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, she was trained in both music and painting, but there's still very limited information about her. Um, this book here, it's 369 biographies from 1550 to the 20th century. Um, this is how I came about um, a lot of the women in that we're discussing today. Anyway, what it says here about uh, Angiola is, apart from limited knowledge about her professional life and the fact of her marriage to Scanabecchi Monetta, we know little about her life. Um, we know that she wrote four oratorios, um, but sadly, all that still remains of those oratorios are the libretti, which were not by her. Um, and yeah, the music is gone. Um, another interesting figure in this land of no remaining music is a woman by the name of Maria Anna Mozart, who was lovingly known as Nannerl. She was the very talented sister of some guy named Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I mean, who's that, right? Um, we'll just call him Wolfie. Um, but under the direction of their father, Leopold Mozart, Maria and Wolfie would have toured and performed extensively when they were children. Um, Maria was considered an exceptionally brilliant and precise keyboard player and a very able improviser. Um, however, Wolfie was, was better at the improv, and there's no doubt that she could have been a good composer, but her potential received little attention and she never received any instruction in the art of composition. So when she grew older and was no longer considered a wunderkind, um, she stayed at home while Wolfie went and toured in Italy. Um, there was this quote in the book that said, Maria's performing value to her family was as a child prodigy, which is really unfortunate. So the reason that we know that she composed was because Wolfie would have sent her a note in 1770 after she had sent him a song of hers. Um, and he said he had forgotten how well that she could compose, and he definitely thought very highly of her abilities. Um, so none of her compositions survive, and we don't know if she wrote anything else beyond this song, with anything beyond this song. Um, and that's all. And this here was a, a painting I found of the Mozarts. What fun. So moving on, we are now going to talk about the Italian composer Cesarina Ricci di Tingoli, born in Tingoli, and she flourished in 1597. Her 20 madrigals were published in Venice of that year, 
um, but nothing else is known about her life. And most of the information we have about her is quite vague. Um, there's a website by the Ricci Ensemble, who we will get to hear from in a, in a bit here. Um, they say that she was born in Rimini, and she may have been taught by Ruggiero Giovanni, full stop. And on the title page of some of her works, she was referred to as Madonna, suggesting that she may have had slightly elevated origins, but even this is not certain. Uh, what we do know is that she published her own book of madrigals shortly after, interesting fact, the first publication of a book of madrigals by a woman. Um, yeah, Cesarino is after, just interesting. Um, and her book was called Il Primo Libro de Madrigali a Cinque Voci, un, un Dialogo Atto, my Italian is awesome. Um, so, but sadly, this book survives incomplete with two of the five parts missing. However, um, the recording that we're about to listen to, um, there are some scholars who have worked to reconstruct the, the missing parts through musicology. Um, so the, I'll get Matt to set up the example here. It's called Stilo Lanima Pianto and it's being performed by the Ricci Ensemble and they their work is primarily in yeah in madrigals and in these renaissance songs and they have some of these reconstructed pieces for us to listen to listening to Renaissance music. I could never get, I could never get old for me. So next on the list is Hélène de Montjeru, or the full name is Hélène de Novo de Montjeru, Countess of Charnay. And there's actually a decent amount of information about her comparatively 
Um, and it would actually be possible to piece together a full narrative, especially if we look at some historical events. Um, but in the sake of time, I'll just go with uh, what I could find here. So Helene was born in Lyons, France. She was provincial and of noble birth, and she was well educated. She was a virtuosa piano, sorry, virtuoso pian pianist and composer, and she was considered ahead of her time. Her teachers included Muzio Clementi, Anton Reika, and Jan Ladislav Dusek. She experienced the, so she was alive when there was the, transi the transition from harpsichord to forte piano, so at the birth of the forte piano. And she actually commissioned the building of a forte piano for herself. And in her, so in her music, she um, really explored different expressions and um, sort of dynamic ranges that she could get with the different pedals that were introduced with the forte piano. Uh, she later taught at the Institut National de Musique, which was founded in 1793. And two years later, in 1795, she was appointed the Professeur de Première Classe, or a first class teacher, at the newly established Paris Conservatoire. And this is actually a really huge deal at this point in time because women were not given these teaching posts. So that tells us so much about what an incredible musician she was. Um, and yeah, she had a two year tenure there at the Paris Conservatoire. Um, Helene is actually the person who wrote one of the earliest instruction books for the forte piano. So that would be things with like etudes and, um, to help develop technique um, and different expressive possibilities. And this book was called the Corps Complet pour l'enseignement de forte piano. Um, her work has been described as a precursor to romanticism, and many of her etudes are beautifully balanced, intensively expressive works, which bear the characteristics that we now recognize as the, as the hallmarks of romanticism. So, in the middle of her life is this very huge historical event known as the French Revolution, and Helene was very certainly affected by it. Um, and I will go on after I talk a little bit about the French Revolution to tell a story that shows another level of how amazing her piano playing was. So a little bit about the French Revolution. So this happened in 1789 to 1795. And these are consider considered the most tumultuous years of French history. Um, this, there was a dividing of aristocracy and the poor. Um, and so instead of doing like proper research on the French Revolution, I instead rewatched a food documentary about the French Revolution. So all of my little bits I'm going to talk about here are derived from food, but it really gives you a, a really um, clear picture of the disparity between the rich and the poor. So the rich would have just gorged on these really huge meals while the poor rioted for bread. Um, so for example, one of King Louis the 16th breakfasts would have included lamb cutlets, roast capon, which is a whole chicken, a whole chicken, Westphalia ham, eggs and orange flower water, which was the, perfum the perfume of Versailles, and champagne for breakfast. So what would happen was there were so many aristocrats that would die in their baths because their metabolism was so slow from eating so much. And so some of them just stopped bathing all together, just like, don't risk it, instead of, you know, just eating less. Um, so meanwhile, 90% of the population survived on nothing but bread. So the revolution began with setting fire to the Bastille. And so this happened on July 14th, 1789, when the Bastille was stormed by revolutionaries and burned to the ground. On October 5th of the same year, Versailles was stormed and King Louis and Marie Antoinette were taken to Paris and put under house arrest. And then in 1793, they were sent to the guillotine. And so then over the next 12 months was the reign of terror where um, the revolutionaries would take the aristocrats and they would 
taken to the guillotine, and so 60,000 people were killed. So what on earth does this have to do with Helen? So her husband was, uh, her first husband was the Marquis de Montjeru, and he died in 1793 as an Austrian prisoner, prisoner during the French Revolution. So his death left Helen a very wealthy aristocrat widow. And so therefore, definitely somebody that they were looking at during the reign of terror. And so she was condemned to the guillotine, but this is the best. At her tribunal, Bernard Servet insisted that her teaching and performing skills were essential to the National Institute of Music. So they brought in a harpsichord and she pretty much like played for her life. Like, you know, um, oh, my brain's losing it in RuPaul and they have to like lip sync for their life. This is like play for your life, but actually. Um, so she played and improvised on the Marseillaise with such spirit that all that were present there impulsively joined in singing. So uh, yeah, she, they let her go. She saved her life by her amazing piano skills. Um, some sources say that this might just be a legend, but I like to think that it's true because that is the best story, like saving your life with your chops. So uh, the piece that we're going to listen to here, and we're going to listen to all 12 wonderful minutes of it, is a piano fantasy by Helene de Mangerieu.
Okay, I hear that and I just gotta clap. Like that is that is so good. That piece is amazing. Like I think Helen might be one of my new favorite piano composers. So good. I am in no way surprised that she saved her life with her music. Like that is so good. Oh, fangirling over. The next composer that we're going to talk about is Eva Delacqua. And she is a Belgian composer born in 1856 in Brussels. And finding information about her was particularly difficult. Once I found out that her father was an Italian, Italian painter, I was able to find out a little bit more about her family by looking up information about her father. Um, so she's a Belgian singer and composer of Italian origin. And her father was Italian painter Cesare, sorry, Cesare dell'Aqua. Her mother was Carolina van der Elst, and she also had a sister named Alina. Eva wrote about 15 operas and operettas, um, and many of her earlier works were performed privately in Brussels and Paris, as is to be, pardon me, to be expected of a female composer in this era. But at least five of her later works were publicly produced and performed in Brussels. Um, in 1890, she performed the lead role of her opera La Ruse de Pierrette. And then she died in Isel in 1930. But she has a piece of music called Villanelle, which is actually a standard repertory showpiece to this day for coloraturas. 
and I had no problem finding a recording of this piece of music. Um, like I, I typed in Villanelle and a ton of high quality recordings by like top named artists of today came up where when I searched for Eva herself, it was nearly impossible to find any information. So the piece that we're going to listen to is Villanelle. And if I'm remembering correctly, it is the effervescent Natalie Desay who is singing on this recording. So if Matt would kindly put up this lovely Kaoda Tura show piece, that would be excellent.
So our final composer today that we are looking at is a Cuban composer by the name of Cecilia Aristi. And you will notice that her dates are exactly the same as Eva. And I have had to like keep double checking because I keep thinking I had an ADHD moment and I wrote them down. Like what are the chances in the same week there's two composers, 1856 to 1930. Anyway, those are the correct dates. So Cecilia was one of the finest Cuban composers of her time. And she was also a very successful concert pianist and a teacher. She is considered one of the most relevant figures of 19th century Cuban culture. She was admired by all the great artists of the time. Yet today, she is somewhat unknown and perhaps even ignored by current historians. So she was born in 1856 in Louisiana, Loma del Argel in Havana, Cuba. Her father was Fernando Arizzi, professor, pianist and composer who studied in Paris. And her mother was Teresa Sobrino. Um, early at, in age, Cecilia showed a talent for composition. Um, at age eight, she had composed a Hail Mary and a Mazurka. Her father was her first teacher, but then she also later studied with Nicolas Ruiz Esperado and Francisco Fuente. Um, she adopted the technical rigors and patterns of European music as is seen in the names of the pieces that she would have written, such as the ballad, Romanza, the waltz. And this is actually something um, you will see with a lot of Cuban composers. Um, as soon as I read that line, I was immediately re reminded of the guitarist Vila Lobos. Um, same thing, there's a lot of that European influence in the music of composers from South America. Um, and so they've got this really beautiful blend of sounds in their music where they have, yeah, the South American, but then it's blended with the Western classical. Um, so yeah, I was I was really excited when I saw that same that same trend there, which makes sense. Um, her family frequently had musical evenings in their home. Um, so like the salons, just like we see over in Europe where people would host musical evenings with compositions by amateurs or professionals um, and played in a private setting. Um, and so this is where many of her compositions were performed was in these private salons. Um, after she completed her studies, she performed as a concert pianist in Cuba and in the United States. Um, in 1896, she performed at Chickering Hall and Carnegie Hall in New York City. The following year, several of her early compositions for piano were published in New York and later by the best publishers in New York and Europe. Um, afterwards, she became a professor at the Conservatory Perelade de Musica of Havana, and she published a manual of piano technique. Um, so beyond her piano pieces, she's also composed for the violin. And one of her most, the, the piece that is considered the best of hers is a trio for piano, violin, and cello. And it was actually the first wo work of chamber music written by a woman in Cuba. Sadly though, I couldn't find it anywhere. And I searched, I was really hoping to find this because I love a piano trio. Um, so instead, we're going to listen to a gorgeous piano piece of hers called Scherzo. It's opus 17. Um, and in the recording, we're just going to listen to the scherzo, but there's also a barcarola on the recording. So highly suggest um, taking some time to listen to it again. Um, and I'm going to apologize right now. The quality of this video is not great. There's a lot of background noise because it's at a recital but it is a great piece of music and I hope you enjoy Scherzo by Cecilia Avizzi.
today folks um but i just really wanted to um pay mind to some of these composers that we don't get to hear about very often simply because we just don't know a lot about them but they have fantastic music and i really hope that you all enjoyed the music of these individuals are there any questions today there's actually time i actually left time <laughs> While I'm waiting, if anyone's got questions, um, I keep forgetting to mention that I do curate playlists for every week. Um, and we have those ready for you on YouTube. Um, and then for all of those items that are not on YouTube, I have them linked on my website, KendraHarder.com. And then under the tab Musical Herstory, I like to have um, yeah, all of that information in one place so you can find it. So there'll be links to recordings if they aren't on YouTube and I'll have links to the resources that I use for the week. Um, is there anything else on there? Oh, and then the PowerPoint note, the PowerPoint notes. I like to, I'm, I'm trying very hard to get them up Wednesday beforehand so you can see that. All right, so I have a question here from Rosemary. My question is about the women's clothing. When did women begin to dress with shoulders, arms exposed, and men are completely covered? That is a great question. I, I believe we started seeing the, the, the changing in dress in the 1920s. Um, and this is based on my diligent watching of Downton Abbey, not on actual uh, research but as i understand with the 20s that's when we started seeing like shorter skirts um and yeah exposed arms and not the gloves you know although you actually you think you still saw gloves if you were in the more um high-end things so that's when you saw that um but men have always been covered in the tuxes as far as i know in the suits um yeah great question rosemary also have a question from emma rush how did you find the composers you talked about this week? <laughs> Diligent scouring through a couple books that I have. Um, so one of the main ones here was this, this book here, 369 biographies from 1550 into the 20th century. Sadly only goes to about 1950. And it literally just lists composer after composer after composer. Um, and it will even like divide them up by regions as well. I do not know how well this is coming through on the screen. Um, this is where <laughs> this is where one of the, the perks of ADHD comes in handy because you get so hyper focused and you just zoom in on things and you're like, I'm going to keep doing this until, you know, 10 days have passed by. Um, I also referenced um, Convent to Concert Hall. Uh, it's not here with me at, tonight. Um, I'm at the SSO, by the way. Um, thank you, SSO, for your wonderful technology. This is much better than my computer. Um, anyway, um, so that, that book also had a lot of information as well. Is that where I found all of them? Yeah, I believe so. Oh, and besides Lies Gingras, which I found from my RCM textbook. Great question, Emma. All right. Anonymous attendee says, not really a question, but the conductor at EMV is developing a program of Baroque female composers. That is excellent. Um, for those of us who don't know, what does EMV stand for? I would love to know so we can follow them on social media or find them on <laughs> so we can find them on online and, and follow them. Early Music Vancouver. Thank you. So Early Music Vancouver is someone we should all pay attention to who is developing this program. Thank you. Um, the playlists are wonderful. Okay, here we go. Is the music available for Cecilia Arizzi's piano, violin, and cello? Um, I'm trying to think if I found that on IMSLP or not. 
on. Let's do a really quick look. music yeah she was also difficult to find information for um i lucked out with one website um uh, sorry got distracted by the chat there for a second um i found a website with a biography about cecilia in spanish so i had google translate translate it for me that was great um I don't even know that IMSLP has much of hers actually now that I'm remembering. Um, somebody here says, my bookstore in Paris, Ontario was able to find a copy of Sounds and Sweet Airs. Yes, that is awesome. Yeah, I found a copy on Amazon. I didn't want to go through Amazon, um, but I couldn't find one by any of our local um, book publishers here. But yeah, you can find them used, which is excellent. Oh, IMSLP did not match any documents. So yeah, I don't know. I you'd have to do some digging, but I think with yeah the the best d digging you could maybe find music for that. I would love to find it. If anyone ever finds it, you let us know, and maybe we'll have to like crowdsource a recording or something. That would be so cool. Are there any other questions I can attempt to answer for you all this evening or things to just discuss? <laughs> what is my t-shirt? <laughs> so this, I, I am going to forget the name of the, the people who made this, um, but it was a company out in the States. Um, I'll stand up nice and clear. Um, they were printing them for a fundraiser to, um, I believe it was to help one of their students get to school. Oh, I am botching all of the memories. Um, but yeah, it was from some, some women in the States. They had reached out to the SSO and said, hey, we're doing a thing. And I was like, I'm spending my money on that. That was awesome. <laughs> but yeah, it's a female composer's t-shirt. I don't know if they're still doing it. <laughs> All right, well, as always, if you have any questions throughout the week, please feel free to reach out to me on social media or through my website. Um, I am on Twitter um, at harder underscore Kendra. Um, and <laughs> sorry, my Facebook is Kendra Harder Composition. And yeah, please reach out to me if you have any other further questions and I'd, I would love to try to answer them for you. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for being here. This has been absolutely lovely. Thank you for paying such diligent attention. And we will see you all next week when we talk about the guitar. So my bias is going to be coming out. I am so excited. All right, so I'll see you all next week. Everyone have a lovely weekend. Bye-bye.